Sean Arbuckle, if you've seen the play, this is Werner Heisenberg. Sean, uh, Sean comes to Copenhagen after a season at the Stratford Festival of Canada playing Nick in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and Orsino in Twelfth Night. He has been on the New York stage in the Waverly Gallery, Spring Awakening, and Henry VI. Regional theater appearances include the world premiere of the Spitfire Grill, Picasso at the Lapinagil, the Merchant of Venice, and All's Well That Ends Well. Mr. Arbuckle is a graduate of Duke University and the Juilliard School. And as I said, he played Werner Heisenberg in Copenhagen and did an excellent job. Next is, and as he would say, I'll be brief no matter how long it takes. <laughs> Dr. Murph Goldberger. <laughs> Murph was a former Dean of Physical Sciences at UCSD, as you've heard, and Caltech president. He's one of the leading particle and nuclear physicists of his generation. His scientific career blossomed early on while he was a graduate student of Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago. As an independent scientist, his major contributions have been in several fundamental areas, including scattering theory, causality and dispersion relations, the theory of weak interactions, and magnetic hydrodynamics. In addition to his numerous scientific breakthroughs, he has greatly influenced his contemporaries through the active role he has played in developing science policy at national and international levels. For several decades, he was deeply involved in the issues of arms control. He served as chairman of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on International Security and Arms Control from 1980 to 1986. He served on the President's Science Advisory Committee from 1965 to 1969. More recently, he was co-chairman of the National Academy of Sciences Committee for the Study of Research Doctorate Programs in the United States. He's a difficult act to follow. William Kane. William Kane has appeared on Broadway and in New York in Conflict of Interest, Wit, The Understanding, The Heiress, A Delicate Balance, You Can't Take It With You, Boys in Autumn, Wild Honey, The O'Neill Plays, Master Gate, A Streetcar Named Desired, and Promised Land. He won the Best Actor on Broadway nomination for his role Wil as Wilson in Promised Land. His experience in a number of regional theaters includes our very own La Jolla Theater. Mr. Kane received an Emmy Award for his contribution to the miniseries Separate but Equal with Sidney Poitier. He is also the founder of the Trinity Square Playhouse in Providence, Rhode Island. He's also an excellent lunch companion. Mr. Kane plays Niels Bohr in Copenhagen. One of my favorite people, Dr. Herb York. Dr. Herb York began his career working on the Manhattan Project at Oak Ridge, Tennessee during World War II. Dr. York was the first director of the UC Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. He was also appointed director of defense research and engineering by Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy. From 1961 to 64 and 70 to 72, Dr. York was chancellor of UC San Diego. That means he was our first chancellor at UCSD. From 1979 to 81, he served as U.S. Ambassador to the Comprehensive Test Ban Negotiations in Geneva. In 1983, he founded UC San Diego's Institute on Global Conf Conflict and Cooperation and is also an ex-officio member of IGCC's International Advisory Board. In 2000, Dr. York received the prestigious Vannevar Bush Award from the National Science Board for his leadership in the arms control movement and his work in nuclear energy. Dr. York is playing himself today. <laughs> <laughs> Tanny McDonald. Tanny McDonald has appeared on Broadway with Dame Diana Rigg in Medea, with Raul Julia and Sheena Easton in Man of La Mancha, with Christopher Plummer and Glenda Jackson in Macbeth, with Geraldine Page and Tennessee Williams Clothes for a Hot Summer, uh, for a Summer Hotel, with Eva Marie Saint in The Lincoln Mask, and with Zero Mostel in her debut. Fiddler on the Roof. She has toured nationally in Mon of La Mancha with Robert Goulet and in Broadway, Jekyll and Hyde. Tanny was born and raised in Princeton, Indiana. Upon graduating with honors from Vassar College, she studied music in Paris, France as a recipient of the Reed Hall Fellowship under the tutelage of Nadia Boulanger, Jean Doyen, and Jean Casadouz. At Vassar, she was awarded the Francis Walker Prize for Excellence in Performance. She is listed with Who's Who in America, Who's Who in Entertainment, and Who's Who in the World. Ms. McDonald plays Marguerite Bohr in Copenhagen. Dr. Jens Alz -Niels Nielsen. Dr. Alz Nielsen is a professor of physics at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Dr. Alz Nielsen met Niels Bohr at the age of 17. Dr. Alz Nielsen was deeply impressed by his interactions with Dr. Bohr and thus decided to study physics. 
The Bohr family invited Dr. Alls Nielsen to their famous parties in their honorary home at Carlsberg at several occasions during the time he was a student in Copenhagen. After earning his degree, he was employed at the Danish National Laboratory Rizzo, founded by Niels Bohr to prepare Denmark for introducing nuclear energy. He conducted research based on the neut neutron beams from the reactor built at Rizzo. His present research interests are focused on the very intense X-ray beams that are now becoming available at synchrotron accelerators. Dr. Stephen Chapin, UCSD sociologist, Dr. Stephen Chapin received his BA from Reed College and his MA and PhD in History and so Sociology of Science from the University of Pennsylvania. He is an author of A Social History of Truth, Civility, and Science in the 17th Century England. The Scientific Revolution, co-author of Leviathan and the Air Pump, Hobbes, Boyle, and the Experimental Life, Princeton University Press. He is co-editor of Science Incarnate, Historical Embodiments of Natural Knowledge from the University of Chicago Press. He has written numerous papers in the history and sociology of science. His interests include the history of science in 17th to 19th century Britain, the sociology of knowledge, and specifically the sociology of scientific knowledge, the sociology of work, and skill in relation to scientific practice. <clears throat> Finally, my colleague in the Department of Physics, Ivan Schuler. And some of you heard me say this earlier. You know that I followed Murph as being dean. And Ivan has pointed out to me on a number of occasions the difference between my being dean and Murph being dean. Ivan has told me that when he went to see Murph and asked him for money, Murph would tell him a story about how he knew Barbara Streisand and not give him any money. <laughs> <laughs> when he comes to see me, he always complains, no story, no money. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan is a UCSD physics department professor and a Cal IT squared scientist and is a solid state physicist, a fellow of the American Physical Society and a member of the Chilean and Belgian Academy of Sciences. He has won many awards including the American Physical Society's Wheatley Award and the German von Humboldt Prize. He has published close to 400 technical papers and has given more than 200 inviter lectures at international conferences and is one of the 100 most cited physicists in the last 15 years. He has given numerous public lectures about science to young and old. On UCSD TV, Professor Schuler has interviewed notable scientists such as Nobel Prize laureates uh, Sir Harold Croto and Walter Cohn, and is currently producing a movie about nanomagnetism. Based on his earlier theater studies in Chile, he believes that being a physicist is as much fun but way easier than being an actor. <laughs> Ivan will be our moderator this afternoon, and I leave the rest to you. For me, this is a real new experience. I have never put together actors and scientists and historians, uh, so I hope this will work well and we'll see how this goes. Uh, the way we will do this is will be not like Mozart, uh, since I was talking to Tani McDonald, it will be not like Mozart, it will not be very orchestrated, it will be more like Donizetti's uh, <laughs> octets. We will each one chime in whenever you feel like or whenever it's good for the music. <laughs> so let's do it that way, and uh, we will start uh, the first question. Uh, I, um, since this will be also televised, we have to have uh, set a little bit of background before we talk specifically about the play. So I would like to start with Steve uh, Shapin uh, to tell us a little bit about the historical background of the years, uh, the 40s in Europe. So if you could just give us a few words about that. If I can put it this way, there is um, a line which appears in both acts of the play, and it's Heisenberg's question. And the question, if I can quote it correctly, is uh, to Bohr, does the physicist have the moral right to work on the practical exploitation of atomic energy? That question seems to be a very interesting way of talking about the historical background because it presupposes that physicists consider the social responsibility of their work. And much of the debate that takes place between Bohr and Heisenberg presupposes an international community of scientists who may or may not share that conception of moral responsibility. As an historian, I think one of the interesting things to bear in mind is that is a very precise moment in history. Scientists, physicists from the Greeks through the 17th century into the 20th century have, many of them, happily worked in national interests in the context of warfare, from Edmund Halley to J.S. Haldane to Haber in the First World War. 
So the question for an historian is, what is the precise conjuncture of 20th century science that leads Heisenberg to ask Bohr that question, which seems to us such a natural question? Uh, there's no stable answer to that, but that remarkable community gathered around Copenhagen from 24 to 27, so they can talk about an international community sharing values and sharing knowledge, Rome, Leiden, Cambridge, Copenhagen, Berlin, Munich, Leipzig. It was a remarkable particular conjuncture, but it's not a trans-historical reality. So that Heisenberg's question speaks from a very specific moment and for a very specific group of physicists. So maybe, Jens, maybe you can tell us a little bit what was it like to, uh, to live in Copenhagen in the, during the war? Well, <laughs> I cannot really tell you uh, from my own experience because you know, I was that, <laughs> that, that size. But, uh, but uh, what you probably don't realize in America is what occupation is because your country has never been occupied. And uh, in Denmark, uh, talking about history, um, Bismarck uh, tried uh, out his army machine in 1864 and decided that he would like to conquer some of Denmark, which he did, you know, just like that. And therefore, one third of Denmark, or one quarter, was occupied by the Germans for 60 years, from 64 until 1920. And from 1920 to 1940 is only 20 years, which is not much. So being occupied is, uh, is uh, not nice at all. And uh, <laughs> that is set in the play also, both by my friend and, uh, and uh, by Paul. So Murph, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the science of this whole thing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what, what is all this business about the bomb? What is the business about the reactors? What is this, uh, the, the, the plutonium? Why is that? Uh, can you kind of summarize, summarize it for us briefly? In about a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, to be quite serious about it. As soon as nuclear fission was discovered by Otto Hahn, and his colleagues Strassmann and Lisa Meitner in 1938. All physicists recognized that were there in fact, in addition to the splitting of the uranium nucleus into two parts, uh, if there were neutrons emitted at the same time, constituents of the nuclei, in sufficient number, two or more, that there was the possibility of a chain reaction that is, a, a reaction the size of which would grow indefinitely under certain circumstances. And uh, there was no mystery to it because chain reactions were something common uh, already in the chemistry uh, field prior to that. In 1939, uh, the Germans began a project to study the create to the generation of energy from nuclear reactions and also weapons. It coincided roughly with the same at the same time in the United States when there was the famous letter from Einstein to President Roosevelt that was sort of the beginning of the American project, although it didn't actually start up for a couple of years later than that. The technical issues that I was alluding to is the way you make a bomb, well, the natural uranium consists of only 0.7% of an isotope, someone that has the same charge and different mass, uh, of the total mass of ur natural uranium. And it's only that that splits into two parts upon the absorption of a neutron. Uh, therefore, a way to approach both energy generation and particularly making a bomb is to separate the isotopes of uranium. Uh, there were a number of techniques for doing that, some of which were in fact invented uh, by the Germans, ultracentrifuges, but there were a number of techniques. They knew how to do it, but felt that it was probably beyond their industrial capacity to do it in reasonable quantities. At the same time, it was discovered that natural uranium in the course of a chain reaction with it produces a new compound called plutonium, which shares with natural uranium the same capacity to split into two parts and give 
large amounts of energy. It was that route that the Germans decided to follow, both from the standpoint of producing energy to power uh, electric power stations or submarines or what have you, but also it was the material out of which they hoped eventually to make a bomb. Well, at this moment, I think that it's appropriate to ask Bohr, or I actually, after seeing the play, I can't think of you, but <laughs> as Bohr, can you, you always look to me like Bohr. Say after, that again. After the play, yeah. I'm saying, you look to me like Bohr. Oh, do I? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I can't think of uh, changing that image. Uh, can you tell us about what the play is all about? <laughs> so describe us. Is, in, uh, is that all minutes. you want? <laughs> yes, that's, uh, I hope that you can do that. <laughs> two hours. About two and a half <laughs> hours, yeah. Well, it's about why Heisenberg came to uh, Copenhagen in 1941. And, uh, but in the course of that, uh, you know, investigation, it's sort of, sort of like Heisenberg is on trial, and we're supposed to render some kind of verdict as to what his motives were and why he came. And, but in the course of the play, we find out that's very difficult to find out. And it seems to me that seems to take over the play. Is how difficult of the uncertainty, which kind of parallels, of how uncertain it is to know exactly what happened at any particular time. Uh, is that concise enough? <laughs> That's very concise. So I, I, I guess I will ask Herb uh, whether you have an opinion. Do you think that Heisenberg knew what was going on? Well, I think Heisenberg f f understood very well the, the, the physics of the, of the bomb. He, he didn't understand it perfectly, but he understood the general idea. And uh, he, he, he did uh, start down the road of building a bomb for the Germans. Uh, incidentally, everybody who might have started down this road did. The Japanese started, the French started, the British started, the Russians started, and then only we succeeded. Uh, and, but the reason that we succeeded and no one else did was the isolation, isolation and the power of America, the industrial power. Only we could do it. So when Heisenberg says it was too hard to do, that's a simple truth. It just couldn't be done in Germany under those conditions. Again, to bring the Japanese in, and it's sort of a parallel, Nishina in 1943 wrote a report which said that nobody can build an atomic dom bomb during this war. It was one of the great understatements, but, but that was the conclusion there as well. So, so the, uh, the idea, I mean, I think that that Heisenberg probably was, was happy that it was hard to do, but I don't accept the notion that he, in any moral sense, tried to sabotage the program or slow it down. He simply said it can't be done, correctly said it can't be done, and, uh, and, uh, he, and I, I, he, probably was, he probably was pleased with that. I mean, Well, the main, the main issue, it seems like it was something about calculating how much amount of this uranium-235 you need to do. So maybe we should ask Heisenberg well, or Sean directly if, do you think that, uh, can you give us a sense of Heisenberg's kind of inner feelings or inner Heisenberg? I, I know that this is a difficult question to answer. Right, and anything that I, I, I mean, it's all my guess. It's all, and it's all my interpretation of the character, which I, you know, is, is different from the man. I mean, I, I, I can't pretend to know what Heisenberg actually was thinking. All I, all I know is, is what the play tells me, which was thoroughly researched and what I've learned in my own research. But um, what, what I think is that, I mean, as Dr. Uh, said, uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think he was probably greatly relieved to, to discover in his calculations that, um, that it was not going to be possible for Germany to, to produce a, a bomb. Uh, um, during the war, um, and I think that was true of many, it seems to be true of many German scientists, um, because what they found after the war, what the Allied um, <clears throat> troops w were surprised to find was kind of the disarray of the German atomic bomb project, and perhaps one of the reasons for that is that none of them really wanted to make a bomb, at least not nearly as much as the Allied troop, uh, the Allied commanders wanted to make a bomb, because the, 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 the Manhattan Project was very focused, it was very clear in its objectives, it was very uh, clear in, in, in the time frame they thought they had to work, uh, they thought they needed to uh, work Feel on free it. to chime in if you disagree. Um, but, um, but, but was, which, was, uh, which was different from the, uh, the, German, uh, the German atomic. Uh, well, I was going to say in regard to that same question, the calculation in my mind is not actually crucial. The calculation is the critical mass. 
which he did get wrong. But had he got it right, the conclusion I think would have been the same. It cannot be done in Germany at this time. Yes, the, this, play, this play is at, uh, I, at least I seeing the play, I found it at different levels. There is this obvious issue, what did Heisenberg tell Bohr? But there is some other things, like for instance, there is this issue that uh, uh, Professor Shapin has brought up as social responsibility of scientists. So those are kind of the obvious things. But there are more subtle things that I got out of the play, maybe that's motivated by myself, is there is an issue between father and son, between teacher and pupil, between good and evil. Do you think there is any of that uh, in Frame's intention, or is the play really focusing on, uh, on this particular issue of Heisenberg and Bohr? Oh, no, I think he definitely tries to make uh, more of it than just the historical uh, repetition of it. That's, that's not his uh, intent at all. He does uh, view it from three different perspectives, and in that sense, it's uh, the, uh, the complementarity uh, uh, syndrome, and you can't find anything, you never know anything exactly, you just know its approaches from different angles. Each person approaches it from his own personal viewpoint. So in that sense, you get, you get three different perspectives, and um, uh, you never get the exact answer. So that's kind of a fascinating thing to, for all of us, for all of us in all of our lives. Um, there is this, uh, there is this, uh, this mixture of, uh, between science and humanity here, about there is this issue of complementarity, which is interpreted by humanists differently, of course, than we have a very precise definition. There is the issue of, uh, of the uncertainty principle. Can any of the physicists comment about, do you think the science, the way it is displayed in the play? This was a question that came up, actually, just two days ago during a conversation at the, at the playhouse, uh, that the science and the, the, this mixture of science and it's kind of scientifically correct the way they interpret uncertainty or complementarity in the play the way Frayn does it? I thought they handled it very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, I thought the play handles it very well. And it all, it all brought home memories, you know, of learning that uh, material from people, uh, many of whom had been part of the Copenhagen group. So I thought the science was handled very well. I was a little surprised at how much of it there was <laughs> and wondered about whether people other than myself who, who knew something about it would whether it would hold their interest long enough, but apparently, but apparently, it's successful <laughs> in doing that. I mean, before we stray too far away from <coughs> the issue of the of Heisenberg's attitude about the bomb, there's a widespread misconception that Heisenberg at some at some point said it would take a ton of uh, uranium to make a bomb. That's simply not true. Heisenberg knew, and it appeared in various reports, the initial reports to the German ordinance people, that one was involved with 10 perhaps to 50 kilograms of, of, uh, of uranium. So he really did know how to, uh, to do that, that calculation. And I don't know where that thousand number ever arose. Well, but even, even that, of course, is a very non-trivial amount of separation of isotopes. No, I, I understand he did, in fact, in the early it, near the beginning, make an erroneous calculation, in which he used the, the in which he used a uh, essentially a random walk extended over 80 steps, and that he did come up with a ton. I mean, he later came to understand it differently, but I believe he well, did. As you can see, this, uh, this is uh, typical of physicists to argue about it. Uh, you wanted to chime in. And this, well, well, I was going to say that one of the one of the places that he mentions a ton is in the uh, farm hall transcripts, which was which were the with the transcripts of, of the secret recordings of the of, of the conversations of the German scientists when they were being um, held um, at, at at farm hall after they'd been ca after the war in Europe had ended um, before before the bomb had been or right after the bomb had dropped. He, he makes, he, there is some, when he was talking to Otto Hahn, he does say something about a ton. Um, but it's, it's high, it's, it, he but says different things over the course of the war, and it, it kind of, it, and, and he does at, at some point. And then Hahn said, you always used to talk about 50 to 100 yes, kilograms. exactly, exactly. So it's, so it's odd as to why at that point he says, you need about a ton there, because as you, as you say, Hahn, say, Hahn corrects him and says, he used to say 50 kilograms before. And that's why I said it really. The, the, the ultimate outcome, the, the conclusion that it couldn't be done in Germany at that time, is does true. not it's hang out this right. issue. No. It's an interesting mm -hmm. side issue. So William, can you tell us a little bit about the theater aspects of it? Uh, it seems like uh, Bohr, so far as we know, was not at all like the interpretation that is given to him. He wasn't as 
Oh. Verbal and as <laughs> aggressive. Can you tell us a little bit about oh, that? Oh, yeah. How just, do you go about actually uh, studying a play like this? Well, apparently Bohr was a notorious mumbler. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and he spoke about six or seven languages. The trouble was knowing which language he was speaking in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't play on stage. <laughs> and, and to get Frayne's ideas across, you know. So they, and, and, but all of the characters are sort of like that. Uh, your character apparently is not as emotional as he is shown in the play. Apparently, we met uh, Heisenberg's son in Concord, New Hampshire, where he teaches. And uh, he was talking about how his father was. And uh, what did he say? Well, but basically, he, he and his wife both uh, felt that the, that the characters, as, as they understood them, uh, especially his, his father he was talking about, were true emotionally. Um, and true in terms of the intentions or the perhaps the inner life of the characters, but uh, that they were they were more impressionistic portraits. They were not actual kind of reenactments so maybe, of. Maybe Jens, you can you can interject here since you actually knew Paul personally, <laughs> yeah. so you can tell us. Well, uh, I thought actually the way you did Paul was uh, was uh, quite accurate, uh, both in the physical appearance and. Uh, and in the dialogue, and uh, apart from the mumbling that uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> apart from the mumbling. Yeah. So I, my feeling yeah. was that it was uh, uh, pretty accurate. And coming back to your question about the father and son relation, my impression was also that, that Bohr was indeed a father figure. He was a f uh, father figure in the institute, not only for Heisenberg, but for dozens of physicists. But I found it very interesting, this issue that he they talk about Kramers, and, Bohr, uh, and Heisenberg is kind of jealous of Kramers, so far as I could tell it. And I could see the sibling rivalries in my own family, where my two sons sometimes, you know, are worried about one getting more than the other. So, so, um, so this brings us to, the, to this issue of the other parts of the play, which have to do with social responsibility of scientists. So can you comment about that? This is a difficult one, I know, because uh, we scientists tend to go into the lab and just kind of want to twiddle our knobs, I guess. <laughs> can, I, can I approach the question that w this way? Michael Frayn, not a physicist. Uh, he does come out of philosophy, and this is a deeply philosophical play, and he's obviously a novelist and playwright. And I think the last two are interestingly connected, because if there is an overall message of the play is that there is no answer no stable, knowable, determinate answer to the question of why Heisenberg went to visit Bohr in September of 1941. These things are inherently unknowable. And uh, Frayn nicely, I think, uh, points out that if you ask what motivated Heisenberg, you have cross-cutting cross -cutting motivations. They might include the desire to slow or stop the Nazi project. They might also include the desire to impress Niels Bohr, his father. Uh, reading the farm hall transcripts, you get a sense that he's also motivated by wanting to be a very clever physicist. And therefore, getting it right involves taking the step to building a bomb. What is it that Heisenberg wanted? That's the sense in which this, uh, this play has to be understood as a philosophical comment on knowing what motivates people, but also I would have thought an actor's play, because <coughs> actors have got to motivate characters for them to be characters. So Herb, what do you think of all this? Well, I, <coughs> you know, it's one thing in retrospect and another thing in, in real time at the time. You know, we, during the war, we, were, we did have a social motivation. It was to help win the war, to end this period of almost 30 years during which 100 million people had already been killed. So we did have social responsibility or political responsibility. It was to build a bomb and, and end the war. Now at the same time, all of us, I mean most of us had, did realize that this was a big step. There was something here about opening Pandora's box. There was a future to be concerned about. Uh, so it, there was some mixture in the feeling. But the basic idea during the war was that our, our responsibility is to help win. And when we first, when I first learned about Hiroshima and when people generally did, the first reaction was we did it. 
So, Margaret, what is the role of the wife in all this, <laughs> since this was brought up before? Well, we know very little about Margrethe as, as a person. Uh, the fellows had biographies to look at. I didn't have a biography to look at. But I think in play, uh, she serves kind of like a Greek chorus at times, and trying to cut through all the smoke screens that these two uh, wonderful physicists are throwing up, and uh, getting to their actual personal uh, motivation, uh, what really motivates them way down in, at, at the instigation of something. Is it, is it really um, a scientific discovery, or is it really some kind of personal level, some kind of personal jealousy, some kind of personal ambition? And Margreta in the play keeps cutting through all that, keeps trying to get back to, to what really motivated them on a personal level. Um, but also I think she serves as the kind of allied um, perspective on Heisenberg. Uh, she, I was very interested in hearing what you said about the occupation of Denmark because that makes a lot stronger what yeah. I've been playing. I didn't realize that Denmark had been uh, occupied for 60 years before all this, so you can see how important that uh, uh, is to us, that, yeah. that the occupying forces, as represented by Heisenberg, is coming to visit our home, and we're going to have to... So what was the feeling of, uh, of Danish people, in, you know, if, when Heisenberg comes to visit from the occupying power? Uh, pretty angry. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's embarrassing, and, uh, uh, and uh, at, at that time, you know, we were occupied, but at that time, you know, Hitler considered the uh, Danes to be great. You know, they were even greater than than Germans were because they were the real Aryans and so on. So they were very gentle in their <coughs> occupation of Denmark during the first couple of years and so on. So there was a whole spectrum of Danish feelings. Somebody were actually, you know, pro Hitler because he brought order to Germany and they didn't know about the other things. Born knew about these things. And uh, he, you know, he, again, it's a father figure. He went down and traveled through Germany in the 30s and helped uh, the Jews to, uh, the Jewish scientists to uh, get positions in Copenhagen, in Sweden, and, and other places. He, he was very active in that. I see. So, Murph, uh, what do you think at the end of the whole story? Do you think that actually can we solve this problem at all, or can we get to this, uh, somehow to this, uh, the bottom of this issue? Well, it's very hard, Ivan. Mean, if, you, if you look through <clears throat> a lot of the literature, there's a, a historian at uh, Stanford named Cassidy who has looked very deeply, wrote a biography of, of, of Heisenberg. Uh, you come up with, with a very complex uh, person. Heisenberg traveled not only to, to Copenhagen, but to a number, a number of other countries during the war. And on one occasion, he was in Holland, and he said the Americans or the, the Allies don't have the energy to control Europe. It's a question of uh, the Germans or the, or the Russians. And he thought the Germans were the lesser evil. Uh, he was a very patriotic German, but I don't believe he was a Nazi, and I think he had some sort of image that after the war was over, they'd throw Hitler out. And so is there a difference between Nazis and, uh, oh, he made and a very the patriotic Germans? Yes, I think very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, on one other occasion, he was visiting uh, a physicist named Gregor Wenzel in Switzerland in 1944. And, uh, he, Wenzel said, well, it looks by this time that Germany has lost the war. And Heisenberg's reply was, it would have been so beautiful if we had won. Uh, I found that very uh, unnerving, <laughs> that, that he would use that terminology. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, he labored under, under very difficult circumstances. If I can tell just a brief story about my encounter with Heisenberg, I didn't know him well. But I met him in 1952. He came to Chicago. He was exactly the same age as my teacher, Enrico Fermi. And we had a discussion with him about theoretical physics. And he really didn't seem to know what was going on. And another young person, Murray Gell-Mann, and I made some snide remark. <laughs> and Fermi came over and really chewed us out. He said, you should have seen him when he was 25 years old. Yeah, it sounds like you have given him back what he was giving Bohr in the play. <laughs> in a <laughs> sense, in a sense. And just finally, I've come to, to think about this. Heisenberg 
came back after the war to a country that had been devastated, that uh, had no money, no facilities, and it was unreasonable of me to expect that seven years later he would be on top of of modern physics, but that's a later revelation. Well, so that, that brings us to this, this interesting thing that uh, as, a, as a physicist, I was sitting in the playhouse there listening to Heisenberg and Bohr, and to me, it sounded like listening to my teachers. They knew what they were talking about. <laughs> so I, I actually am puzzled by this. How can you, it's almost, I presume, I presume you don't have a background in physics or in, uh, in science, or in, in, and it's very difficult. Uh, how do you prepare for a role like this? Or what do you do to get to? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we had a lot of help. We had a lot. <laughs> there was a lot of research done for us. Um, we had a, a stack of information just uh, in in the rehearsal room as a as a constant companion. I mean, I, I was a good high school <laughs> science student, and so a lot of it was you know started to come back. But I mean, I had to, it, especially in terms of the debate that that uh, Bohr and, and Heisenberg have between the formulation of uncertainty. I mean, it, it, for me anyway, it gets to be pretty delicate and pretty finely tuned. So I mean, it was hard for me to try and understand that. But I got to a certain level where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be doing my dissertation on fission. And, and, but I, I did try to, I, I, I mean, I did try to I have to understand the, the science to a certain extent. Um, but as I said, I mean, we were thankful to have had a lot of help along the way because it's not something that uh, we could have just done on our own. But still, it seems like you have to have a sort of a logical way on which you proceed yeah. in a conversation. And if you don't quite know where it's going, it seems like speaking another language completely. I think, I think Fran's done a <laughs> good job at, at, at so, laying out the science of it. What I mean, do you think of this, William? I had high school physics. I forgot most of it. And I'll, I have to admit, uh, I don't know what he's talking about half <laughs> <laughs> But when we went in, we asked the director, says, do we have to understand this stuff? He says, no, just convince the audience you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and uh, and I, I wish I, I could say, yes, I know what uh, uncertainty is. If you know where you are, you don't know how fast you are. I know that, and I know complementarity. But I don't see how they get anywhere, you understand? <laughs> I, I don't see how they help build the bomb. I don't see how, you know, I, I'm not able to put them into quantum mechanics and make it all make sense because I don't know that much about it. And uh, I wish there were uh, uh, physics for dummies out there, and I would read it, and <laughs> maybe actually, I'd think. There, actually, no, there I is, mean, there is. It, we yeah. have it at UCSD, exactly. we have a course on that, so, so you can, you are actually, and if you want to do your dissertation, I'm sure that we would welcome another I graduate got, student. I got co quantum physics in comic book, book form, literally, and, and I kind of read through that, and, and, and it explained all the personalities, and explained, and, and even that, it got much more, you know, detailed than I could really get, but we had, yeah. we had a lot of... Actually, yeah. those comic books are actually quite good. I they're they're a, very good. I have a physicist. <laughs> I recommend them to... You know. I have a physicist son, uh, not a, a student of physics, and he, he started, started studying physics from those comic books, and <laughs> I, I actually read them myself, and I sometimes learn things from, uh, from those books, actually, so it is not a, it's not a bad source for, especially some of them. So, um, so I still would like to go back to this issue of the social responsibility, which we have not somehow gotten right. away from it, do I actually have a responsibility of, uh, of uh, reading philosophy books? And uh, you know, what, when every time I go to the lab, you know, it's already difficult enough in the lab to get anywhere. Scientists during the Manhattan Project and before have disagreed about whether or not they have a social responsibility, <laughs> or if they do have a social responsibility, to whom that responsibility is. Edward Teller famously said, the physicist has a responsibility to understand the laws of nature, the responsibility for applying those laws of nature, including building a bomb and deciding what will be done with the bomb, is not the physicist's responsibility. Other physicists from the Manhattan Project we know famously disagreed with that. But even amongst those who accepted that the physicist had a social responsibility, what would that responsibility be? Not to work? To foresee the future? to know whether not building an atomic bomb would save lives or whether it would lose lives. So even where there is a, an agreement that the, the scientist, the physicist has a social responsibility, and that's not universally accepted and never has been, the question of what that responsibility is is similarly contentious. You know, uh, uh, most physicists actually don't work on bombs. Most physicists actually not, don't work. I, there is this misconception that physicists work on Big bangs and small bangs. <laughs> and, and actually, most physicists don't do that. 
So do you think that somehow this issue of the bomb is something particularly interesting? Are scientists particularly interesting? Or there is something way beyond that, that actually this play could have been played in a completely different context. I, I, I don't know, a father and a son uh, going down the river and you know, trying to rescue somebody from the, from the I'm not exactly sure how, why I would write a play. Well, that would be a different this. play, of course. I mean, right, I understand, but intention. I'm just wondering if the play, if these, the issues that are brought out by this play. I think the uh, issues that are brought out by this play are important to all of us. I think one of the big moments is when, when Margrethe says what will happen uh, if, if, you know, if the, this bomb has been built, it could still destroy every man, woman, and child in the world. And, and Bohr's answer is, what would happen is darkness, complete and total darkness. In other words, we could, in fact, destroy our let, planet let, let with this you. bomb. But it's not going to stop man from thinking. It's not going to put the genie back in the box. Uh, um, uh, scientists and physicists and, and um, uh, human beings are going to continue to think. You're never going to be able to stop them from thinking. Well, so it's going to continue, whether we like it or not. And what we have to decide is what we're going to do with it. Actually, what I was uh, kind of aiming at uh, asking you is, do you find scientists, but do you find me particularly interesting? I find what it absolutely it? <laughs> thrilling to be up here with all of you and hear <laughs> so what you have to say. I mean, it's so, it's so exciting in terms of what we're doing in this play to hear you people talk about uh, your work, to make it so clear. I mean, you've clarified so much. So I think that uh, we are not going to be able to satisfy uh, all the questions and answer any of the questions. The best <laughs> thing uh, would be to maybe turn over the, the, the questions to, and ask uh, for some questions from the audience. So please. Yes, I'd like to come back to this question of social responsibility just a little bit. Physicists represent, or scientists represent, a very small fraction of society. Why does one ask the question of a physicist, why should you have some special responsibility to do something or not do something? One could argue that the person who builds <coughs> ammunition or the person who trains troops or the person who graze, uh, grows corn to feed the troops also is contributing to a, a, a national effort. Yes. Why, why uh, blame or point at a physicist. Sure, the bomb was a big thing, but many more people were killed by bullets and by starvation than by uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Thank well, you. I don't know whether it's a direct answer, but uh, I remember a uh, citation from Oppenheimer who said <coughs> that the deep discoveries of science is not done because you're looking for something useful. They are done because there's something to find. Mm. Herb? Well, in, in the particular case of the bomb, it was of a magnitude that was different from most things that preceded it. And at the end of the war, the physicists, many physicists did accept a special responsibility for explaining it to the public at large. I mean, physicists that, who were always identified as brilliant nuclear physicists <laughs> were busy at the Rotary Club, they were busy at other clubs, trying to tell everybody what it all meant, their version of what it all meant, based on the fact that they knew it, they had known it longer, and that they knew it in greater depth. And the same thing happened in the, with the government. You find a group of people uh, involved in trying to persuade the committees of Congress, the President and others, with respect to what they should do next in the matter of, for instance, nuclear arms control. And Bohr himself, I mean, one of the big omissions, from my point of view in the play, is Bohr's role in trying to, to do his part to prevent an arms race in particular. He felt uh, strongly that uh, one ought to approach the Russians and uh, not necessarily involve them, but at least to talk with them and let them know what was happening and that this was essential to prevent an arms race. And he actually met with President Roosevelt to talk about it, who then arranged for him to meet with Winston Churchill. And that's where the mumbling comes in, because the story is that he started to explain his ideas to Churchill. <laughs> Churchill couldn't understand what he was saying in any language. And he immediately began talking with somebody else while Bohr went on talking about, <laughs> talking about the necessity of avoiding an arms race. I don't, I don't know the details of the truth of that, but that's the story about Bohr's meeting with, with Churchill. So <clears throat> Bohr took on this special responsibility. 
It was also used as a justification for one of the most important spies. Ted Hall said that Bohr had said, you ought to tell the Russians in order to avoid an arms race, yeah. and Hall yeah. took it on as a personal responsibility to, to do just that. But, but uh, this question of responsibility has many dimensions. It has to do with actions. It has to do with what kind of political role you take or social role. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, please ask a question because in my courses, if you don't ask questions, you'll have an exam at the end of the course. So <laughs> please, uh, there was a question there. The I'd like to hit the social responsibility from the other direction and come back to the physics. Uh, uh, the panel has identified a couple of areas like uh, protection of the environment and energy generation, which uh, I think uh, the physicists have a lot to say about. Uh, why is it uh, in the current day that the uh, so politicians, the sociologists, are not asking the physicists uh, for their input? Why are the physicists not really providing solutions the way they did Manhattan Project, the bomb, and so forth. Is it because uh, our focus on different kinds of things, different sense of urgency, or uh, are the physicists waiting for the politicians to ask them? Are the politicians waiting for the physicists to ask them? Why is it not happening? I, I, I want to chime in here because I believe that actually it is happening to some degree, and uh, actually our dean who introduced all of us, he works on uh, on environmental issues uh, all the time, and I consider him a physicist, although he's a chemist, so I don't hold it against him. Uh, uh, Murph, did you want to say something to that effect? Yeah, there, there are organizations like, for example, the Union of Concerned Scientists that has been very active for, I don't know, 30, 40 years in connection with a whole set of issues. Uh, they recently published a major study called <laughs> Drilling in Detroit, and it had to do with the production of of fuel efficient uh, vehicles. They've been, the Union of Concerned Scientists, been concerned with a whole host, the whole panoply of environmental uh, issues. There is, there is a great deal of attempts at taking response, not playing a leadership role in some of these serious issues that have a strong science and technology uh, component. You had a question there? Yes, a very simple. Was the, there was another question on the left hand side here. Yes, please. Can you explain to me why increased knowledge of any kind is better, is, it's better to be stupid than have increased knowledge of any kind? Mm. Why is there increased knowledge of any kind? No, no. Well, I, I think you just have to look around yourself and uh, it, it, those, those lights that are here, the meal that, were, were, that we had, uh, I think our, our, our age that we live to, it's... Uh, uh, Clearly, increased knowledge is helped out in that, so I don't know. I to, uh, this is just a personal opinion, but anybody, please chime in. I think that... Well, I, I think what you're asking is, why should we ask man not to learn something if it's there to learn? Why should we not climb the mountain? Which is sort of like, uh, you know, it's there. Yeah. Why should we not climb it? Because it all depends upon what man does with it, you know. Now, we, we, we scientists, we build the bomb and give it to the politicians. And the politicians lacking. go out and use the bomb. That's but that is lacking knowledge on the part of people that aren't physicists as well as the physicists on what to do with something new. So increased knowledge may need more increased knowledge, but it doesn't mean a more increased stupidity is better. But I think that this is a little bit like, uh, like uh, music, I think, in some ways. It is a, a human activity that you like to understand things, and why do we play the piano? I mean, there is no reason to play the piano, right? Uh, <laughs> some fundamental reason, but we just play the piano because it's fun. And actually, you'll find that most scientists will tell you this. The reason I do science, it's fun. Yes, please. It's, it's my understanding that the uh, German scientists, when they went to Russia, made some significant contributions to the Russian atomic bomb program. And that always, always led me to believe that, it, that Heisenberg had a serious and purposeful atomic bomb program. When that point is raised, it usually involves the rocket scientists who went from Peinemunde and participated in the early stages of the Soviet rocket program. The, there was no large number of, of atomic scientists who went to Russia and, and helped on the Russian nuclear program. The uh, 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 Hari Tone, who was the head of the bomb project, in Russia was in Germany looking to see what he could find and I don't know what all he found 
But among other things, he found a lot of uranium, which he took back to the <laughs> Soviet Union, uh, uh, natural uranium uh, uh, in a purified state, which they used in the program. But I don't think it's correct that German science helped the Russian nuclear program. Sure. German sure. science was involved in the Russian missile program, rocket program, but even there, only peripherally. The Russians kept them always separate and away from the mainstream. They asked them occasional questions, but they didn't really use them very much. Sure. And I was going to say, it's my understanding that, I, I mean, Heisenberg <coughs> had a deep fear of the Russians and had a deep suspicion of the Russians. And so if, if there were, in fact, aid that came from German scientists in the Russian atomic bomb project, it didn't come from Heisenberg. Heisenberg wanted to, it wouldn't have been his, part, his doing. This, w this was after the war, and I saw it on television, so it may or may not be accurate, but it was, <laughs> Kurchatov, was Kurchatov was under immense pressure to get a successful detonation, and his biggest problems were metallurgical. And they had been able to divert, I understood, about 15 people from the uh, German program and they got them involved, and, and the, uh, the word was is that these Germans made significant contributions. It was mainly in the area of metallurgy. Uh, well, they may it, have. They may uh, have. I actually know personally the head of the metallurgical program, I mean, Kurchatov's particular assistant uh, in, in, in metallurgy, a man who had previously built tanks for Stalin because he was good at the metallurgy of iron. His name was, uh, was Vasily Yemelyano. I don't know whether he had, there may very well have been a few people who provided some assistance, but basically the Russian program was based on indigenous science and, Ameri and intelligence on the American program. I don't think the Germans had much to do with it. Yes, please. Another one for me. Uh, there has been no comment so far about the release of Bohr's papers uh, yes. a few months ago. Yes, there, uh, yeah, somebody, yes. Uh, does anybody want to take that question? Well, the, uh, the papers were letters that uh, he had, was writing to Heisenberg, but since Bohr was so meticulous, he kept rewriting them, rewriting them, finally decided. Magret was rewriting and rewriting. Huh? Yes, right. I was writing. No, no, no. I was writing. No, no, no. No, no, no. Anyway, so finally, they, uh, the play, they weren't supposed to be released to what, 50 years after his death? And, which is 12. Yeah, 12, yes. uh, 2012. And they, the play brought so much interest out, they decided to release them early. And uh, and though and and I, I think most people's take on it is that uh, Bohr said that uh, he thought Heisenberg came there to enlist him to help. He said, "Look, uh, the uh, Germans are going to win the war. Now, if you come in with us now, you'll be on the ground floor. It'll be all the better for you." Uh, people have disputed a half Jew coming into the Germans and be getting it. But uh, anyway, and. Uh, but uh, it, it seems, uh, and then the, as the war went on, and it, uh, Heisenberg changed as the war went on, and when it came finally, it was, uh, the, he was uh, accusing Heisenberg of duplicity. And, uh, but that's just Bohr's opinion, you know? And it, it didn't really uh, do anything to change, you know, the viewpoint here. And I don't think anybody, you know, some, peop some people said, oh, yes, well, now we have absolute proof that Heisenberg was not trying to sabotage the Yemen. Well, we, I don't, it seems I don't like there is an evolution. Uh, it, uh, the books that I've read, there is like an evolution on Heisenberg's thinking, and he has some capacity of deluding himself into thinking that what he had said before was not quite what he said. Uh, is that? On uh, Bohr's thinking, though, too. I mean, the, the two yeah. of them, I mean, it, it, it's a point made in the play that Bohr had four different I versions, at least at some point, right. that he said of what had gone on. But yes, as, as Heisenberg also had, emphasized different points of his story and uh, but but what what was mostly uh, the, the, the part of the dis discussion was silence they didn't discuss it at all so I mean there's never there's never really been a full explanation of either of their opinions yes. no, the really say uh, well, this, this <coughs> letter that you were uh, asking about that was triggered by a book that uh, just had come out and it actually it came out in Danish before it came out in English by uh, Robert Jung and uh, in that book uh, there's a, a citation of uh, an interview or letter that uh, Heisenberg uh, wrote to, uh, to Jung about this meeting. And that apparently upset uh, Niels Bohr uh, quite a lot. And I saw uh, th that letter is actually handwritten, so Margrethe didn't write it. And it's written in Danish because uh, Heisenberg uh, knew Danish. 
And I think that it was, you know, he had to get it out because he, he thought that this was just plainly wrong. And then he, he wrote that letter and then, you know, maybe a few days later he, he considered, why should I send it? Because, you know, what, what will be the outcome of sending the letter to Heisenberg, but maybe it was a relief for himself. Mm -hmm. Ivan, may I comment yes, on please. this? The, the, the thing that apparently enraged Bohr, at least that's the way his son Oa described it after the meeting with, uh, with Heisenberg, was related to the, the letter that Heisenberg had written to Jung, mm -hmm. in which he, f he first announced that, in loosely speaking, the Germans weren't really trying to make a bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, in an autobiography published by Jung in 1993, he says, essentially, I was flim-flammed, and that, that the, the story that Heisenberg was trying to tell me was simply not true. Mm. And that, that appears in his autobiography. It's a book called Trotsdam, and well, published it, in 1993. It seems like, uh, it seems like we cannot uh, solve any of these issues, and that's the aim of the play. I wanted to thank all of you, and especially for being, being able to bring together such a diverse group of people. <laughs> and, but I, I have to thank you personally for one thing. All my life, I wanted to be on stage with some legitimate actors, and finally I made it. Thank you. <laughs>